Well, good morning, everyone. So good to see you here on this beautiful Sunday morning where we've come to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we would dial in, that we'd focus in on Him as our Savior, and that everything that we do today as we worship would be centered around Christ as the King of Kings. Uh, the songs that we sing, as you look at those songs and we sing those songs, uh, is to reflect the, what we believe and what we know about who Jesus is, the prayers that we pray, uh, that is a heart of surrender and submission to God. And then the, the beauty of uh, being able to gather together and to find our, our anchor is in Christ and the teaching of his word over our lives. The authority of God's word is so powerful. It is, uh, it is the, the lamp to our feet. It's the direction to our souls. And so uh, I'm so thankful that we get to worship together this morning on this, this glorious day. And to draw our hearts and prepare us for worship this morning, I like to read Philippians 2 to prepare us as we continue in our journey through Daniel. We'll be in Daniel 2 today. Uh, I'd like to read Philippians 2 in light of that. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in the human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, we are so thankful that you have made your name great, that you've allowed us to be your disciples, your sons, your daughters, that you've invited us to be ambassadors uh, for the kingdom, your kingdom. And so as we are here to, together this morning to worship you, Lord, that you would equip us, that you would prepare us, Lord, that you'd send us uh, for that glorious journey of knowing and, knowing and making your name great. Thank you for being the one thing that we can always cling to, the anchor of our souls. We love you, and we need you, and we worship you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing this morning. I'm 
darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died praise the Praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of All of heaven held its breath Till the storm was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old, it shall not kneel, it shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father. Praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise forever to the King of kings. Sing it with me. 
We're singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song you shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. Scripture reading this morning will be found in Daniel uh, chapter 2. We're going to look at that whole narrative there, Daniel chapter 2. You can find it on page 926 in the Pew Bibles that are in front of you, if you want to follow along there, 926. Uh, And as you're finding your way there, if you need a Bible or you know someone that needs a Bible, please take that with you today. We'd love for you to take that and use it or share it with someone who needs it. So that's our gift to you if that pertains to you today. And so 926, Daniel chapter 2, we're beginning in verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. 
Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, this word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb and your house shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show its interpretation. But the king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word for me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me its interpretations. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, this, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. And so the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. But then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. And he declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is this decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things, and he knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and, now, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went in and said to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon, but bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in your bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in your bed came thoughts of what would be after this, and he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what it is to be. But as for me, the mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation might be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of the image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces, and they became like chaff of the summer, threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hands he has given wherever they dwell, the children of men, the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, 
making your rule over them. You are the head of gold. Another in kingdom, kingdom inferior to you shall rise after you. And yet a third kingdom of bronze, bronze shall rule over the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay. And the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay. And so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix together with one another in marriage. But they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days... Of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. And just as you saw the stone that was cut from the mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king, king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief perfect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request to the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. This is the word of the Lord. If you would pray with me, and then we're going to look at that chapter together. God, we thank you uh, that you are sovereign over all things, that you are the revealer of mysteries, that your word is sure, and that you have spoken to us, and we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us and who you are and the ways that you're moving in the ways that we can rest in your sovereignty. And so we pray that as we look at this chapter and this vision that you gave to Daniel of of what is to come and and how you are working, uh, I pray that we would see it afresh today, that we would understand your great power and and might over all things, but also your great grace that you are at work over everything that happens in the world. And so we pray that you would give us eyes to see that clearly today. We pray that you would be our teacher that you would lead and guide us in all truth as we spend time together in your word. We pray all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I have a cousin in uh, Texas that actually, uh, part of her job is she does uh, estate sales. And she goes in uh, the small town in East Texas and different people in the town, if they've passed away or whatever happens, or the family doesn't want to deal with it, she goes in and kind of liquidates everything in this house. And it's interesting to me, this job that she has, it's a little bit strange in some ways, that she goes into these houses in this town that's been there for a long time, and oftentimes it's been two, three, four generations. And so 100 years, 150 years of history in this one house, and her job is to go in and basically liquidate everything, put a price on it, sell it, try to get rid of all of it. And it's such a strange thing to think about, to walk in to a house that has all these memories and all this life that's been lived and all these things happening there, and then your job is just, okay, we're going to get rid of all of it. And I was thinking about that, kind of just that job and going through that, but also like what that would be like. Uh, or, or imagine for a second it's your house, that now you've passed away and, and someone comes into your house after you've died, and they start to look at all the stuff that you've accumul- accumulated your whole life, and pictures, and your family, and all these memories, and all these things, and now it's just time to sell it and get rid of it. And uh, thinking about kind of the, the temporal nature of that, but also <clears throat> what would it say about you if somebody walked through your house and looked at all your stuff and all the things that you gave your life to? What is the story that it would tell about what you saw as most significant? And I want you to just think about that for a second. I don't know if you've ever considered that before or, or something along those lines. Uh, my guess is if you're older than I am, you've probably at least thought about it a couple times, probably progressively as the older you get. If you're younger than me, you may never have thought about it. But it's an interesting thought experiment to kind of walk through and think, well, what would that be like, right? To, to have somebody come in and, and all that just is gone and it's, it's kind of a weighty thought experience or experiment. 
And not that the stuff is that significant. It's really not that important, the stuff that's there. But it leads us to think about our legacy and what we're living for and what's of the most importance and what we give our time to and what that looks like. And it starts to kind of spark some of those questions. And maybe you've thought that before. Uh, I've heard several people say that one of the good things over the last year and a half with global pandemic and all the things that have gone on and kind of the craziness of the world is it's kind of forced us to slow down and stop and think about those things, right? Like when, when things shut down or when work stopped or different things that happened, it made everybody kind of stop and go, okay, what are we spending our time on? And why are we doing that? And what does that look like? And that's maybe a good thing that's come out of it. But what, the way that we answer those questions about what are you living for and what is most significant and what will be lasting, uh, the way that you answer that will have a profound effect on your peace and your security and the way that you operate in the day-to-day, -day, the way that you operate when things get kind of out of sorts like they have the last year and a half. And so I start there just by posing that question because I think that's partly what's happening here in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, it's Daniel chapter 2 uh, in this book of Daniel that we started a couple weeks ago. Daniel is a young Israelite that has been taken captive and brought into Babylon, and now he lives in the king's court. We talked about that last week. And he's under King Nebuchadnezzar, who's maybe the most powerful man in the world at the time. He's the king of Babylon. And he has this dream, and he's, he's uh, angry, and he's frustrated, and he's kind of shaken by it. And he's throwing threats around, and he's really kind of overtaken by what happens. And, and Daniel's going to stand before him and try to give an answer to what he's dealing with. And I think a part of what Nebuchadnezzar's dealing with is something that we all deal with when we face our mortality and what's going to come in the future and what that looks like. And so there's a lot that's going on that the king is wrestling with that's very pertinent to us. And then I would say that Daniel's answer and what he tells him is extremely important to us when we understand what he says here. And so today as we look at chapter 2, this is the way I want us to look at it. First, this problem that the king has. What is he wrestling with? What is he dealing with? The heart that's underneath that that's causing him to be so shaken. So that's the first part. Then the second part, I want us to see the answer that God provides and how that kind of uh, speaks truth right into the midst of our struggle. And the same with the king. We have a very similar struggle in our own hearts. And then lastly, how do we live in light of it, right? So the problem that's there, the answer that God gives through Daniel, and then how do we live in the light of it? And so let's just start with a problem that arises that comes with the king. We just read this whole chapter, this big long chapter, and so we'll just hit on pieces of it here. But it tells us right there in the first verse the problem. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. And so he's upset. He has a dream so much so that he can't sleep and now he's agitated and he's frustrated and he calls all his sorcerers and magicians and all his wise men in and he says, I want you to tell me what this dream is about. Now, he does this in the way that you would expect uh, a king who's used to getting his own way, who works through uh, violence and, and uh, power and kind of tells people, you do what I say or I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and so he calls them all in, and that's exactly what he says. You see that in verse 5 and in verse 6. He says, this word is firm. If you do not make known to me the dreams and its interpretations, you, you shall be torn limb from limb and your house shall be laid in ruins. Basically, he says, I'm going to kill you and your whole family if you can't tell me what this dream is and the interpretation. That's kind of the way you get a, a glimpse of the way Nebuchadnezzar rules, the way he operates with a firm hand that's extremely violent. And what we know from history and about Babylon, that's absolutely certain. They would go in and destroy places and lay them waste in the most awful ways. And so this isn't really out of character with Nebuchadnezzar. But he's shaken, and so he starts making these threats. And so the Wise men come in and they say, well, tell us the dream and then we'll give you an interpretation. And as ruthless as Nebuchadnezzar is, he's also not a fool. He says, I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. You're going to tell me what the dream is. How am I going to know that you've got the interpretation unless you know what the dream is? And he says, right, like I, I can hear the, the wheels spin or think about the wheels spinning in his mind. I'm going to tell you the dream and then, yeah, anyone can make up an interpretation. You can all come up with different things to tell me, but to know that you really know what you're talking about, I want you to tell me the dream. And so he sets that before them, and they all go, no one can do that. You're crazy. That, that won't work. No one knows your mind and what you're thinking. We can't do that. We can help you with the interpretation, but we can't tell you the dream. 
And so it makes him angry, and he's ready to kill all of them, just as he said. And then Daniel hears about this. We saw last week that Daniel and his friends have been brought into the king's court. They've been indoctrinated into kind of the way of Babylonian life. They're learning and growing. Daniel and his friends are some of the best and brightest that have been brought in from Israel. And they hear about this, and Daniel hears about it, and he says, what's the big deal? Why is everybody so scared, and what's happening? And he hears, and he says, well, let me talk to the king. And I'm always struck that Daniel says, yeah, I'll talk to him. Let me have, uh, put me on the calendar. Let me in to talk to the king. But Daniel doesn't have the interpretation. He doesn't know what the dream is at that point. He just says, I'll talk to him. And then right after that, they say, okay, they're kind of working towards that. And then Daniel goes back to his house and he begins to seek the Lord. And so I'm always struck by that, that here's this awful king that's ready to kill people at the drop of the hat. He knows this. He's seen the brutality living right there in the king's court. But yet Daniel has such faith that he says, I'll go and tell him. He has such faith that God can make known to him the dream that he says, put me on the schedule. I'll go meet with the king. And so they do, and they, they, they bring Daniel in, and he goes off, and he spends time with his friends praying and seeking the Lord, and God gives him understanding. And so he goes before the king, Daniel, who at this time, we talked about this last week, is still a teenager. Right? Last week, chapter 1, the best we can tell, he's probably 15, 16. Chapter 2 here, he's maybe 18 years old, 19, somewhere in that range, still a teenager. And he's going to go stand before the most powerful man in the world. And he goes and God gives him this understanding of the dream. And so he goes and stands before him. And the way the narrative lays out, we don't know what the dream is until we get to verse 31, right? Because Nebuchadnezzar says, I had a dream and you tell me, nobody can tell him. And so it's not until Daniel tells him the dream that we actually hear what it is. And so verse 31, he says, you saw, O king, behold a great image and this image mighty and its exceeding brightness stood before you and its appearance was frightening. The head of its image was of fine gold and its chest and arms of silver and its middle and thighs of bronze and its legs of iron and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And so you see this image of a person made of different materials and he says, that's what you saw and he's telling him and then he says, and then you saw a stone that was cut out by no human hand and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then it basically destroyed all of it. And then the stone became a great mountain. And it says that it filled the whole earth. And so he says, this is your dream. This is what you saw. And you can imagine at this point, Nebuchadnezzar's taken aback a little bit. Like he was wisely saying, I'm not going to tell you what the dream. You're going to tell me. And Daniel shows up and tells him exactly what the dream is. And so you can put yourself in Nebuchadnezzar's shoes for just a second. That might be like, okay, (laughs) you have my attention now. He knew what I saw, but then the very next thing, then he tells him the interpretation. He says, now, verse 37, we'll tell the king its interpretation. And he says, you, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, and to whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of men, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, making your rule over them all, you are the head of gold. And he says, so in this image that's made of gold and then silver and bronze and these different things, you're the gold, you're the head. Babylon, and you're ruling over it, that's you. But then he says, another kingdom inferior to you shall rise after you. And yet a third kingdom of bronze shall rule over all the earth. And then a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks into pieces and shatters all things. And so he says, these are all kingdoms that are successively going to come and rule after you. And then he says, except there's going to be this stone that eventually is going to come and it's going to destroy all of it. It's going to wipe it away and nobody will remember those kings. And so what he tells him is you are the great king and you're over Babylon, but your kingdom's not going to last forever. Think about God giving him that interpretation and showing him the dream. And then he goes, and now you've got to go stand before the guy that kills everybody that crosses him and tell him, oh, and by the way, your kingdom's not going to last. But Daniel putting his trust in who God is and what he's done. As we read through that, you heard him say that before he gives him the interpretation. He says, I have the interpretation, but it's not me. It's because God's shown it to me. It has nothing to do with me. Don't be taken with who I am. It's God alone that's shown me this. And so he stands before Nebuchadnezzar and he tells him, your kingdom is fleeting. It is only going to be for a time. And someone's going to come after you and then another one after that and another one after that. 
And it has a very uh, Ecclesiastes feel to it, right? The Ecclesiastes written by Solomon and, and looking at vanity and vanity is all vanity, that all of it comes and goes, that everything you work for will be passed down and will be taken away. And that's basically what Daniel says to him. Your kingdom is fleeting and there's going to be those that come after you. And so you can understand why Nebuchadnezzar was so shaken, why he woke up in the middle of the night and couldn't sleep. Because everything he's working for in his life, everything that he's about, making this huge kingdom and a name for himself, and I'm the king over it, and I have the power, and all of a sudden he sees that that's all going to go away. He's brought face to face with his own mortality, the terrifying thought that we often ignore our whole life, that he's going to die, that his kingdom's going to be gone, that no one's going to remember. He says it's going to be destroyed and it's going to float away like the chaff, but it's going to be gone. And so Daniel tells him this, and it's hard for him to face, I'm sure. It's hard for us to face. Uh, I've cited this for years, but I remember reading an article many years ago that uh, I've looked at different times. There's lists of people's greatest fears. And always, almost always, if you go look, you can, whatever poll they do, greatest fears, it's funny, public speaking and spiders are always like one and two. Death is always like three or four. It's always like after spiders. <laughs> and they said the only reason that that's the case is because so many people actually just ignore that death exists. That the way that they deal with it, this is what psychologists say, the way that we deal with it is we just pretend it's not there. We just deny it. And that's the only reason it's not number one on every list because we just kind of like, oh, I'm not even gonna gonna, uh, address that. And so oftentimes we just ignore the fact that life is a finite amount of time that we have on this earth. We ignore that it's coming And we just kind of put our head down and keep going after the things that are in front of us. You know, through the years, uh, being a pastor, you end up doing a lot of funerals. I've been a part of and presided over a whole lot of funerals the last 12 years. And one of the things that I've heard regularly at funerals from the family and different people is uh, they'll, they'll often say, well, time heals all wounds and just give it time. Things will kind of get back to normal. And I've heard people say that for years and years and years. And I've often thought that maybe part of that is, is what they mean. And I'm not saying everybody means this, but I think sometimes what people mean when they say that is give it time and we can go back to denying that z- death even exists. We can just go back to pretending it's not coming. Just give it time and then we'll go back to work and we'll pretend like it's not there and we'll put our head down and we'll get back to the things that we normally do. And so oftentimes that's what we do. We put our head down and we go to work and we try to build our own little kingdom justify our existence, make it all about us, fill our house with stuff, right? continue to accumulate things to make it like this is what I'm living for. But when all of a sudden you have this vision like Nebuchadnezzar has and you see that it's all fleeting and it's all going away, that can be really terrifying. Suddenly it's brought face to face with that. This past week I was listening to uh, a podcast And I listen to a whole bunch of different podcasts, and so sometimes one will end and the next one will start, and it'll just be kind of what's next to my thing. And it came on, and it was was actually uh, one that I normally wouldn't listen to. It was two comedians just kind of talking about whatever. And it wasn't anything of great depth, and I was kind of about to switch it. And one of the guys started talking about uh, a dream he had. And so the two guys talking, one is a professed atheist and one is an agnostic. So neither one of them are believers, neither one of them believe in God or say they do. And so they start talking about this dream he had, and then all of a sudden it turns into this very like philosophical uh, discussion about what's of most importance, what matters, what will be of lasting significance. And so suddenly I perked up, I'm driving down the road listening to it, and I go, I want to hear how they answer this. And so the one guy who is a professed atheist that had this kind of dream starts talking about how he feels like he, he had this great insight. And the only thing that will stand, the only thing that will be of any value is the, the, the good work that we do. Like he's a comedian and he's talking about, he's talking about like a special he did that got on TV and this other thing. And, and these are the things, these are the pure things that I've done that I did really well and those things will last forever. And I sat there listening to him driving down the road and I thought, man, they are grasping at straws. If you think as a comedian your special that you did is going to last forever, 
He's not even that good of a comedian to begin with, but even, even if he was the best comedian in the world, the greatest who's ever lived, are people going to remember that 100 years from now? Are they even going to know who you are? No. And we cling to those kind of things and we pretend like that that's the answer. Like, I'm going to do these things. I'm going to put my dad, he, head down. I'm going to make this great thing. And that's what's of lasting significance. And I think that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar was wrestling with. And all of a sudden, he sees this vision and it scares him to death. In fact, we'll see next week in chapter 3, a couple years later, Nebuchadnezzar still wrestling with this. He's still trying to make it about himself and what he does and the kingdom he builds. But God brings it face to face, him face to face here that it's not going to last forever. And his kingdom's not going to last. And that's a scary thing for all of us that we have to deal with. So how do we answer that? What does God say here through Daniel that brings an answer to this question that we wrestle with? And so rewind back here for just a second. Go back to about verse 17 here. As Daniel hears about what's happening and the threat before he goes before the king, he says, I'll meet with the king. And then verse 17, it says, Daniel went to his house and he made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. And so they pray. They go before the Lord and they seek him and his wisdom that he would show them what is true. And so in those moments when we feel that kind of existential angst, the first thing we do is we seek the Lord. We continue to come before him in all things. Instead of relying on our own wisdom and what we think, we go before God and we continue to seek his face. And that's exactly what Daniel and his friends do. And then God gives him this vision, shows him what this means and what it is. And he shows him what he's going to do. And in so doing, it leads Daniel to what he says there in verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Think about what a remarkable thing that is that Daniel says there. Can you imagine? Can you remember just the the last couple years what Daniel has seen? He's a boy in Israel and Babylon comes in and destroys where he lives and takes him away from his family and pulls them out and brings them back to Babylon and puts him kind of to work in the king's court. It's taken away from his family, everything he's ever known. A few years later, Nebuchadnezzar's going to destroy Jerusalem. He's going to live through all this and see all this, but yet this is what he says. Blessed be the God forever, the name of God forever and ever. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He's still in the court of the evil king Nebuchadnezzar, the guy that destroyed where he lives. And yet his perspective is now God alone is the one who removes kings and sets up kings. In the middle of this suffering, in the middle of what he's dealing with, and his inclination is to praise God that he is sovereign over everything and that he's in control. And so how did he get to that? How did what God show him lead him to be praising God and saying it's all what God's doing and he is sovereign over everything? And so think about the interpretation and the dream that he has there, right? The dream that he sees these successive kingdoms and what God shows him, that Babylon is the gold and it shows you the different kingdoms that come after that are inferior, like verse 39, the kingdom inferior to yours shall arise and yet a third kingdom of bronze shall rule over the earth, and a fourth kingdom of iron. We're going to come back to this vision in Daniel. I'm going to kind of leave it uh, in shadows here in some ways. But we're going to come back to this vision as Daniel's going to see variations of this vision multiple times in the book of Daniel. And you're going to start to see some of the details that emerge. And it's talking about what we see in history, the kingdoms that come after Babylon, the Medes and the Persians. And then Greece with Alexander the Great. And then the Roman Empire after that. And God gives him this clear vision of how these different nations are going to rise and fall. And how they're all going to come. And they're going to come and go, but that God is sovereign over all of it. And that's what he tells Nebuchadnezzar. But I want you to think about how Daniel gets to the place where he can praise God in the midst of Babylon. He's still there. And he's still struggling with it. And he has been wiped out and brought into this and his family and all the things that he saw. But yet he can say, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. 
So Daniel sees this vision, but then he sees one last part that I don't think that he saw fully. Maybe he did. Maybe God showed him exactly what was to come, but he saw it at least in shadows because he says there'll be nations that rise after nations. He says, uh, verse 34, talking about the vision itself before he gives the interpretation, he says, there'll be a stone that's cut not by human hands and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And so what he sees is there's going to be nations that rise and fall, but there's going to become the stone that's cut not from human hands that's going to destroy all of them. And he says, that's going to become a great mountain and it's going to fill the earth. And so what he's talking about there is he's, he's using the language that God has used with many of the prophets. And I don't know how much of that Daniel was seeing and how much God showed him, how much of that was still in shadows for him. But we now seeing the fullness of what God has done and the whole of the Bible can look back and piece that together. So Isaiah chapter 11, he uses very similar language. He talks about how there'll be a shoot that comes from the root of Jesse. There's one that's coming, and when he comes, he's going to bring everything together in a holy mountain, and God's glory will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And we know now, looking back on Isaiah and what he was talking about, the root of the tree of Jesse is Jesus, the one who comes in the line of David. Or here when it talks about the stone that's not cut from human hands. That's what he sees, a stone that's not cut from human hands and the language that's used that he's talking about. Do you know how Jesus refers to himself in Matthew chapter 21? He says he's the stone that was rejected and he has now become the cornerstone on which all things are built. And he refers to himself in that way. And we see that repeating in the New Testament, this idea. And so the stone that's not cut from human hands, God himself comes Jesus, it's a type of Christ that we see right there in the Old Testament, and God's giving Daniel this vision. There is one that's going to come that is going to lay all kingdoms to waste, and it's going to set up a kingdom that will never be defeated, and it will cover the whole earth as the waters cover the sea, and you can rest in that. And that's what he's showing him. And so you think about, well, how does that happen? How does that come together? Why does that bring him to a place of praising God in the midst of Babylon? So listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead and the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, but a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, but also in Christ shall be made alive, each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and then after his coming, those who belong to Christ. And so what he's saying there in 1 Corinthians 15 is that Jesus is physically, bodily raised from the dead. And what that means for us is that death has been defeated. And one who's come that's undoing all of death and sin and evil in the world. But then listen to what he says right after that. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, and God may be all in all. Do you hear what Paul says? That Jesus is going to come, and when he returns, that every authority and power and reign will be put under his feet and will be destroyed in death itself. And Jesus will rule and reign over all things. And I think that's what Daniel was seeing. I think that's what God was showing him. Nations will rise and fall and they will come and they will go. But in the end, this stone that is not cut by human hands will set everything right. And that stone is Jesus. And he uses that language of this great mountain and it will cover the entirety of the earth and all things will be made perfect. And I want you to think about how that leads Daniel to this place of praising God in the midst of all that is going on around him. 
that he can go, blessed be the name of God forever. He changes times and seasons and he removes kings and he sets up kings. If you know the end and you know what God is doing and where it's moving, you can continue to praise him even in the midst of all of this. And that's exactly what Daniel does. And he trusts God and he sees how he's moving and working in this. Sadly for Nebuchadnezzar, says that he's real impressed. He's very impressed with Daniel. He starts offering gifts and giving him a new position. Says all these things. Obviously, your God is the God of gods. But he's kind of like the person at the funeral. Right? Nebuchadnezzar's really taken. He was really shaken by it. Really impressed with your interpretation. Now, let's get back to work. Let's go back to things being normal. Right? Because two years later, we're going to see in the next chapter, he's building a giant statue to himself for everybody to worship. How quickly he forgets. And the reality is we're all a lot like Nebuchadnezzar. Right? We get this glimpse and God shows us and we spend time in his word and we're seeking him. We go, yes, you are sovereign over all. And it's you, Jesus, and it's what you've done. And then we get up and we leave and we get busy with life. And then we go, ah, I've got a lot of stuff I've got to do. It's way more important. And we slowly slide right back into it. It's so easy for that to happen. In fact, I I was thinking about this this week. I've had a couple of dear friends the last 10 years in my life that are not believers that went through really difficult things, just hard things in their life. And suddenly their heart was open and they're asking all these questions. And then over years, it starts to kind of close and harden again and go back to all the other things. And how easily we can do that. How great the allure of Babylon is that we've been talking about. That we can do it and it can be about us and we don't have to trust God in all these things. So how do we continue to trust him in the midst of all that's around us? How do we take what God reveals to Daniel here and rest in that? And the first thing I would say to you is that we rest with our identity in Jesus. And what God has done for us in Christ alone, it's the only way. So often when we forget that, we seek to validate ourselves in a whole bunch of different ways. We make it about our work and about our stuff and the things we're accumulating and all these other things. And oftentimes what we're doing is we're looking for validation. We're looking for like, look at me and look at what I have or look at what I've accomplished. or look at. And what we're doing is we're not resting in our identity in Jesus. And it's only when we see that Jesus has done everything for us and he knows the end and he's going to bring it to great, to perfect fulfillment and that he's purchased for us what we could never do for ourselves and we rest in that. That's the only way that we kind of get out of that uh, hamster wheel of chasing a bunch of stuff, chasing, validating ourselves. God loves you completely and totally and fully and it's because of what Jesus has done and nothing else. And it's only there that we can truly rest. We can stop trying to justify our existence when we see that our identity is in Jesus. But then the second thing is when we do, and when we begin to rest in who we are in Christ, it kind of saves us, it releases us from Babylon. It releases us from all the things that the world is saying. We can trust that God alone is the one that's going to do this. And I think that's what you see happening with Daniel. I think you see that throughout his life. He decides to put his faith and trust in God alone. I'm going to draw this line. I'm going to love the people where I am. I'm going to cooperate with them where I can, but I'm going to continue to hold fast to what God says. That's why the 18-year-old can go stand before the most powerful man in the world and go, and this is the interpretation of the dream. Your kingdom's not lasting. And he can stand there and trust because his faith and his trust and his identity is in who God is and not his doing. It's what God has done. And when we do that, it rescues us from getting sucked into the world in those ways. And that only comes through what Jesus has done and nothing else. We rest in our identity in him. So the world is a crazy place right now. And there's a whole lot going on and there's a whole lot of ups and downs and all these things that are there. But God is sovereignly in control of all of it. And his kingdom is going to come. And it's going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And we will see it and we can rest in that. So would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the glorious good news of who you are and what you've done for us. We thank you that even in times where we see so many things going on in the world, 
and it feels like they're outside of your control, that you see the beginning from the end and that we can rest in what you're doing. I pray that you would help us to see that afresh today, to trust you in all things, that you are at work, that you are bringing your kingdom in fullness. Help us to find our identity fully in you and what you've done for us in Jesus and nothing else. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We now get to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper together, and we do this each and every week, uh, partly to, to remind us of our identity in Jesus, exactly what we were just talking about, that we would rest, and that Jesus has finished the work for us. He's done for us what we could never do for ourselves. And by laying down his life for us, that he has purchased our salvation, that he has work in all of it, that he has done for us what we could never do. And so we want to be reminded of that. Jesus himself on the night before he would lay down his life met with his closest disciples and he instituted this time. He told us to do this in remembrance of him when we gather together to be reminded of what he has done for us. And so the scriptures record it this way. When the hour had come, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we get to take the Lord's supper together today to be reminded that Jesus has finished the work for us. And so this is the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Stand with me as we continue to worship this morning. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive unless the Lord does raise the house in vain its builders drive to you who boast tomorrow's gain tell me what is your life a mist that vanishes at dawn all glory be to Christ all our King, all glory be to Christ, His rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ, His will be done, His kingdom come on earth as is above. Who is himself our daily bread? Praise him, the Lord of love. Let living water satisfy the thirsty without price. We'll take a cup of kindness yet. All glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. And on that day the great I am, the faithful and the true. For sinners slain is making all things 
new. Behold, our God shall live with us and be our steadfast light, and we shall ere his people be. Oh, glory be to Christ. Oh, glory be to Christ our King. Oh, glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. Oh, glory be to Christ. Oh, glory be to Christ our King. Oh, glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All oh, glory be to Christ. You may be seated. Please pray with me. Oh, fathers, we uh, are just so encouraged and bathed today by your word, by the reading of your word and the teaching of your word and the authority, God, of your word that we would be men and women and children that would leave this place with the assurance that you are sovereign over all things. God, that your name will be made great amongst all nations. God, that you have blessed all people through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, let our first step in, in a place of unassurance be uh, to, to trust you more to cling to the truths that you have given us, that we would be people that would remind each other of the gospel daily, that we'd call one another to the standard uh, of seeing the world through the lens of the Bible, through the lens of the truth that you've given us, and that we can have just a, a glorious rest there as you are our King. You are our Savior. You are our friend. You are our God. We love you so much. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, a couple of announcements for us uh, today. Uh, first, um, as you've seen, we're continuing to take school supplies up. If you uh, would like to drop some off, you can put those in the foyer. Um, there's a big blue bin out there, and um, Family Connection is going to come by and pick that up at the end of the month and provide for those kids that need school supplies. They'll, that's a way that we can help provide those things. Uh, this coming Saturday, we're going to have our men's breakfast. We're going to meet at the Dawsonville Chick-fil-A. They've opened the restaurant up, so we're going to find a little corner spot. And if you would like to come and enjoy breakfast with us, uh, if you sign up, there's a sign-up sheet at the, the welcome desk. Uh, put your name down there, then the church will take care of a biscuit and a cup of coffee for you. Uh, if you don't sign up, then it's going Dutch. You're on your own. All right? So, or bring your own. Uh, but we'd love for you guys to sign up. That's going to be at 8 a.m. Uh, this coming Saturday, where we'll just spend some time in fellowship together at the Chick-fil-A there in Dawsonville. Uh, also, there's a couple of things that are um, out there at the welcome desk, a couple different sign-up sheets. We have the women's late or the ladies' conference that's coming up September the 11th. That will be from 10 till 2. That's here at the church, and you can sign up for that um, just to let us know that you're planning on coming. Lunch will be provided for that. And then we're also having our ladies' Bible studies that will launch in September. That will be on uh, the launch on the 13th and on the 15th. The 13th is a Monday. It will be at 10 a.m. here at the church, and child care is provided. So that will be um, every Monday for a certain amount of weeks. We'll go through First and Second Timothy together through a study. So ladies, please plan on coming there. And if you can't make the morning session, then you can come to the Wednesday night session. And that will be at 6.30, and that will be here. There is no child care for that, though, okay? So 6.30 on Wednesdays or 10 a.m. on Mondays. Come and be a part of that with our ladies as we get to uh, learn more about God's Word together. Um, if you're new here with us, welcome. So glad you joined us this morning. love for you to fill out a connection card. That's a way to get connected to the church and for us to get to know you a little bit more. So if you'd like to fill that out, then you can fill that out, and we will send you an email and just say a welcome letter. And so we're glad that you are here with us this morning. I think that's all the announcements, unless I'm missing something. Excellent. Please stand with me for the benediction. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. 
Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here. 